Hello and welcome to TidyX episode 135. TidyX is a screencast where we go through and explain how our code works. My name is Ellis Hughes. And my name is Patrick Ward. Thanks for checking out TidyX. As always, we, we'd appreciate it if you could like and subscribe on the YouTube channel down below, drop questions, comments. It's a great way for us to address any issues or thoughts that you have uh, on the next episode. Uh, as always, if you feel like the work that we're doing has impacted you positively and you'd like to donate to us, we're always appreciative of anything that you'd like to donate on our Patreon page. With that said, uh, we're going to get in today's episode, episode 135, which is on uh, running cron jobs within GitHub, which is a pretty cool thing. I'll let Ellis kind yeah. of talk about that. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over our markdown file. Uh, and so the cron job is going to pull data uh, basically live whenever we set it to pull it for, it's going to do it like 6 a.m. every morning. And then we're going to have it run this markdown file to produce this markdown report. Um, Ellis, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. So yeah, essentially, let's uh, the, the the problem stage here is say we're a data scientist for a, a basketball team, and our coach came to us and said, "Hey, man, I really want to get every day an updated report on the top players in uh, NCAA men's basketball. I, I want to see that every day. I want it on my desk, or a way for me to see updates every day." And we're like, "No problem, boss. I got you." And so you go. We're we're going to make this dashboard here, but. And, you know, we're able to manually run this every day. But you know what? I don't want to get into the office every day at 6 a.m. before coach in order to send it to him. So how can I do this without losing my sanity? And so this is where cron jobs really help us out. We can take these ideas and the concepts that we're going to talk about today and apply them to other situations. But before we get into that, let's quickly go through this uh, markdown document that's going to, that we would be generating no matter what, whether we do this manually or via cron job. So at the very top, we've got our little YAML there, we've talked about this extensively. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is we're going to create a title that's going to be pasting together NCAA men's basketball recruiting report dash, and then today's date, because we want to be able to add, have dates with, uh, with our, our titles there, or the author is Teddy X. And we're going to do an output. This time, we're going to be doing a flex dashboard output. So we talked a lot about flex dashboards a couple episodes ago. If you want to learn more about them, go check out 100. Uh, episode 133, where we go through in depth. Right now, we're going to kind of go through this at a relatively high level. Um, uh, but then let's go down to our setup. We're going to be loading. Uh, well, I guess first we're going to set the op chunks to echo false. This is because we don't want our code to be shown to uh, for the rest of the R markdown. We they, our coach doesn't care about the, the code. Right, they they want just the the pretty pretty outputs. Uh, we're gonna load four different libraries: Flex Dashboard, Tidyverse, DT, and Rvest. And each one of these are gonna be uh, needed for our report. We have this URL which goes to ESPN.com, where we're gonna be scraping our data from every day because this is uh, all publicly shared. Of course, if this was actually an internal project, you'd probably point this to your internal database or something else, but this is all using public, publicly available tools. Mm -hmm. um, we're then going to read in that HTML using RVEST. We're going to step through and pull out the tables, find them together, do some string manipulation. We're kind of just going to skip over this. We've talked extensively about this in past episodes. You should definitely check it out if you've not. Uh, next, we're going to make this uh, color scale uh, vector for us to use for our plots. So we're going to get the unique positions uh, of the, the players that we scraped. And then we're going to create a vector where the, the names are the unique positions, so like guard, forward, um, and, and others. And then we're going to get uh, colors from the rainbow function, which is included in the base R. And so this is just a quick, dirty way to get unique colors for every position. We want it to be consistent across our R markdown. Patrick, can you take us the rest? Yep. So that's uh, once we've got the data, we're ready to build our report. We're going to have two tabs, uh, as indicated by the double equal sign running uh, along the uh, uh, along row 49 here. Again, uh, check out our intro to Flex Dashboards um, episode two episodes ago, kind of goes over how this all works. Uh, within this offensive output tab, we're going to have uh, two columns. So column one, uh, which 
Um, this is indicated as a column by the little minus signs running along the bottom there of, of row 52. We're going to call it a column, and its width is going to be 40% of the page. Okay, so within that column, we're going to have two visuals. Uh, the first one, as indicated by a little title here with the three uh, hashtags, um, top 10 point scores, is going to be just our typical kind of ggplot uh, data. It's going to be a column plot. Um, the little part here that is, is probably different is there's a little bit of data cleanup here. Um, so with the names, uh, what we wanted to do was instead of having to deal with names crossing over each other because of maybe a really long name or having to set the axes to like 45 degrees or 60 degrees, um, we did a little uh, uh, function here that basically says, hey, look at the name column. Uh, if the name is larger than five characters, uh, or if you see more than five characters, basically set in a line break. So it's going to be like a first name, last name type of deal um, underneath each of the column bars. And then uh, just a little bit of leveling the factors so that they're in some sort of order. <clears throat> um, same thing, same type of thing with the three point percentage. Again, three hashtags tells it, hey, this is going to all be in that same column. This is one picture, uh, one graphic. This is the next graphic. Same type of thing. Just this one was our uh, point scores. And this one is po three point percentage for the games for that day. Uh, for that day. The column uh, next to that is going to take up 60% of the page. So remember, this one up here was 40%. So now we've got 60%. So it's going to be a little wider. And it's going to be a little wider because we're going to throw a data table in there. And we just don't want the user to have to do a bunch of scrolling from left to right to see things. It's, it gets really annoying. So this is a bit of a wider uh, table. Again, three hashtags tells us it's offensive statistics. So that's going to be the little title over that kind of container. And then we're just going to grab a few columns and we're going to dump them into data table, set the row names to false. We did a whole bunch on data table last week. So if you want to see more stuff about data table and conditional formatting and all those fun things, uh, that was last week. The cool thing is that it's basically a copy and paste job from here. You can take that entire chunk, dump it down here and change it to defensive output and make sure that you then change the stat to the defensive stats that you're interested in. In this case, we used uh, rebounds per game for the first plot. The plot underneath that one was the uh, blocks or the top, top 10 blockers from the day uh, again it's a two column so it's going to look exactly the same the second column is going to be 60 percent of the page and it's going to just be a simple uh, uh data table again dt data table um, utilizing information about the defensive ability of the players so that's what it looks like we're gonna we're not gonna knit it just yet um because we're gonna show you how you run the cron job and then what it looks like at the end so if yeah. we go over to our um, if we go over to GitHub here, just slide us out of the way a little bit. Uh, what we're looking at here is our cron job, and I could try and uh, zoom us in uh, just a tad. Yeah. So, so yeah, so this is using GitHub Actions. So GitHub is a pretty great platform, um, generally for open data science sharing and, and code sharing and whatnot. But they have this uh, tool called Actions. So Actions allows you to run code on their servers, or if you have GitHub Enterprise potentially on your own servers, um, on specific situations. And so what you need to do is you create a folder called .github, another folder called workflows, and then you write uh, a YAML file. And so a YAML file, YAML stands for yet another markup language, uh, but essentially what you need to know about YAML, uh, there's, there's a ton to read, lots of great resources online, but it's a hierarchical um, like text file where the as you tab in, those are children of the content above. And so you can see like on line three there, we have on, and then we have some content tabbed over underneath it. And so that's additional information given about the on section there. And so you always want going to, what, I'm not super versed in actions, but in my experience, whenever I look at an action, you have the first thing you have is the on piece, which is telling GitHub when this action is supposed to be run. And so we have three different scenarios where this action might be run. So first we have push 
to branches main and master. So we have push and we define the branches. So this is going to be whenever we push an update to the main or master branch, uh, it's going to kick this action off. Then on line six, you see pull request and, and branches main master. So anytime there's a pull request against uh, main or master branch, it's also going to kick this action off. Um, and then finally, there's schedule. And scheduling is what the cron job is. I mean, there, there's probably additional features that you can do, but this is the one that I'm aware of. Um, so essentially what a cron job is, is you're going to tell the computer, hey, whenever you see this time, and it's defined in the cron string afterwards, I want you to run this job. And so if you're running on something like Ubuntu, it's called cron. If you're on a Windows server, it's something like Windows scheduler. But the idea is, is you've told this computer or the server, whenever this time situation gets met, please run the code for me. Um, and so the string is separated out by minute, day, or excuse me, minute, hour, day, month, year. I believe it's how, how it goes. It can be a little bit complicated to actually write out the, the string though, because you can get very intense ways of describing the time, like maybe you want it to run multiple times a day. How do you define that? Uh, but there's a website, crontab.guru, that can help you figure out what you're supposed to be writing to do that. But in my situation, I was uh, uh, rather simple. I only wanted it to be run at 6 a.m. Uh, every day. And so I set the minutes to be zero, so it'll be at the top of the hour. I set the hour to be six, so then it's 6 a.m. And then I put asterisks for everything else, which is going to tell it, I don't care what those values are, what I really care, um, they can be any value. I just want it to be run at 6 a.m. every day. And so now GitHub knows I want this to be run at 6 a.m. And this is based off of UTC, so it'll be, um, I don't know, the Pacific Northwest, we're eight hours behind. So it's going to run at 2 a.m. every day for, for me, which is you know perfectly fine for my situation. <clears throat> Next, by 12, we're going to give the job a name, and we're going to call it render dash port. It needs to be, uh, it can't have spaces in it. Um, and then we go and have the jobs. And so the jobs section of the action YAML is what it's supposed to be doing. It's like, okay, I know when I'm supposed to run based on the, the on section above. Now is it supposed to be doing? And so we're going to have the job run updated report. <clears throat> Uh, it's going to run on, as defined in line 16, on the Ubuntu latest. You could change that. You also have the option to run it on a Windows machine and a Mac machine. Of course, if you are running um, these on a private repo, this does uh, cut into the number of minutes you can use, but that's a whole other thing that if you're really interested in that, leave a comment down below and we can get into that a little bit. That's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're trying to talk about today. I pass a couple environment variables starting at line 17. So I pass the GitHub uh, PAT token. So that allows the action to run using my PAT. Uh, and then the R key package source, not, why, not quite, quite sure why it's in there, but uh, it seemed to, to be needed. So I left it in there. Um, and then finally, we get to line 20 and on. And these are the actual steps that are going to be run. This is the actual code that's going to be run for the action. And so it breaks out in each section. Each piece of this is going to start with either a uses or a name. So a uses is somebody else has gone through to define the code that needs to be run or the action that needs to take place. And so there's a whole marketplace on GitHub of actions that people have written to make your life easier. GitHub has written a couple of them, but users can also uh, add as they want to. So you can see at lines 26 and 30 that we actually are using some actions that are written by our lib. So the folks at Posit have written a number of actions that make our lives much easier. So we don't have to figure out how to write these at all. So let's start off with the first job here. Um, so if you go up, a little bit further, Patrick, to check out. So essentially what this is going to do is that's going to check out the branch. So it's going to check out the, the main branch into um, the uh, environment that it's at. And that's basically all this action is going to do. It's going to pull in the repo as we have it into, uh, 
into our environment. Next, because we're being based off of a Ubuntu uh, image, it doesn't have R installed by default. So we have to install R. Thankfully, the folks at uh, Posit have written this action that will take care of that for us. So all we have to do is say, hey, use this action to install R for me. And uh, we're going to have it with the option, use the public RSPM. So it's going to use the public RStudio package manager as opposed to um, a CRAN or some other location. So we're going to have that. We are generating a an output using our markdown. So we're going to need to have pandoc installed. Again, our lib is an action for that called setup pandoc. Easy as can be, it's handling everything for us under the hood. And so now we've reached the end of setup and things that we can rely on other people for. Now we need to be responsible for the rest of this. And so the rest of these are going to start with dash name, which is I am defining what's going on here and I'm naming this step. And so this first step here is, you know, once you set up your own R environment, what do you do next? You have to install the libraries you're going to need, right? So like traditionally, you know, you open up your new R, or you, you get a new computer, you build, uh, you install R. You have no libraries other than the base libraries. So now you have to install them. We have to do the same here. So pretend this is like a brand new computer for you. So we're going to install the packages, uh, tidyverse, rvest, R markdown, flex dashboard, flex dashboard, and DT, which are, of course, all the libraries that we're going to need to run our report. Uh, you'll notice on line 35, we have uh, shell R script zero. So the way that I understand these actions, the way these work, unless you specify uh, you want it to be run in a different spot, it's going to assume it's bash code, right? So if you've ever logged into the terminal on your Mac computer, that's um, a shell, right? Uh, I actually want the shell to not be like the Linux terminal, but I want it to be run it in R script. So it's run as R code. So I specify R script there. And so now it'll run that install packages inside of an R script. Next piece is we're going to be wanting to render our report. Uh, so we're going to name it run report. We're going to pass it the R code that we need it to, to render our, our markdown. In this case, we know our report is, or the thing that we want to be running is called report.rmd. So it's relatively simple to put it in there. Uh, of course, if you have a more complicated name or if you're wanting to use this cron job and you, or this, this action, and you have a differently named RMD, you'll have to update this piece here. Again, we have shell, so it's going to be run as its R code. And the next is a bunch of bash code to get Git to work. Because I want to automatically not only render this report, but the action doesn't push anything out automatically. It, it just stays like it's on the computer. And I want to have the, the updates get pushed automatically to my GitHub repo um, on a new branch. So we're going to have some Git config set up just to tell it, hey, this is going to be the quote GitHub actions bot. Um, and uh, specify an, an email. It doesn't actually have to work, uh, but it requires us in order to move forward. Um, and then we're going to actually do the final committing and pushing the GitHub pages. So we're going to run. And this is stuff that you would run on your computer normally too. So this isn't totally out of the norm if you're used to using Git. So you'll use Git fetch to pull any updates in. We're going to rename the using the MV function or move function report HTML to report renamed HTML. So that'll prevent it from barking an error at us if we're trying, when we check out Git, the GitHub pages branch, and it already has a report HTML in there. We're going to check out GitHub pages uh, or GH pages branch. We're going to then rename, again, our report renamed HTML back to report HTML. And that'll overwrite the version that got put in there. We're going to add it commit it, and push it. And so once this action completes, it's now got the updated version of our report that got run at 6 a.m., pushed out to the GH pages branch. There you go. So that is, there's, there's a lot to this, but uh, I think each one of these pieces can, it makes sense uh, if you kind of break it down. And step through it. It's not as scary as my point is. Cool. So let's go take a look at the actions tab here. Yep. 
And so you can see that I had um, report rename report when checking it in. So that was a change that I made to it. And that was from a manual push to update to the main branch. Then you can see the render report uh, tab right there. That was automatically ran this morning. So I didn't do this. This was GitHub Actions. See, it's triggered via schedule 11 hours ago. And we're able to see, and it's, it, it shows you the log of all the different steps that we did. So if for some reason one of them fails, you can click and open it and uh, see what's going on and kind of try to read the report. It is uh, kind of like, you know, bashy type code, but uh, it's part of reading sometimes uh, and dealing with these sorts of things. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, so then we're able to go, let's go back to the main repo, Patrick. Oh no, you're, you already clicked on the, the link, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the link so, is right mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And so we could email that out and say, hey, this is the link and it'll automatically be updated every morning. And we'll know that it was updated because remember the title, we had the sys time in there. So anytime that the thing gets published. And once you click the link, this is what you get. You get your report. So there it is, NCAA uh, Men's Basketball Recruiting Report 2023-211, which is today. So it ran this morning. And we have our uh, rainbow colored um, player names. Notice that they're uh, 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 specified by you know first and last name, um, looking for the five characters and then putting everything else onto the second line. Uh, and we have our cool little table here. We're showing 10 entries. It's searchable. Uh, we could go through all the different pages of it. We've got 50 entries there. On the defensive tab, same type of deal. We've got the uh, rainbow colored columns. We've got our players down below. Um, remember, and we talked about this in the Flex Dashboard uh, episode, you can always set the fig width so we could make this bigger. We could spread it so that it fills that container a little bit more. Uh, this is just a quick, uh, quick and dirty default. So it's going to stick that right in the middle. Uh, but we can, um, we can style this however we want. And then the, uh, the data table here, notice that it's again, 60% of the page. While these are 40, so the data table fits. We don't have to do any right left scrolling. We just uh, the person can just go ahead and look at all the uh, information, or they can obviously get all of the row entries and not have to search through tabs. Exactly. And so that's how you can take something that you could be running it. Well, a make a report could be running it manually, but you say no, I'm lazy and I'm going to have a computer do this every day, so I don't have to remember to do it and make sure that my coach stays happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so with that I guess we're going to call it on episode 135 as always my name is Ellis Hughes you can find me on Twitter at ask Ellis underscore Hughes and my name is Patrick Ward you can find me on Twitter at, at OSP Patrick at tidy underscore explained is where the screencast lives on Twitter tidy dot explained at gmail.com is where the screencast lives in the gmail world um YouTube is the best way to get in touch with us, though. Like and subscribe. Drop your comments down below, questions, things that you'd like to see in future episodes. As always, uh, we love doing this. And if our work has some way positive, has, has had positive impact on your work and you'd like to donate, we do have a Patreon page. We're always appreciative of anything that uh, you may give. And that's that. Thank you all so much for joining us for 135 episodes. Keep on exploring your world.